Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jacob Hill. I am the data and service manager for the Digital Library of the Middle East. Um, work, I work at Stanford uh, Libraries. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about today about uh, the, di the Digital Library of the Middle East and particularly how it's implemented in Spotlight. Um, I'll start by giving a little bit of background on the project um, just for context. Uh, DLME is a, a traditional aggregation project in many uh, senses of the word. Um, I think that the, the basic idea is to improve access, discoverability, interoperability around um, cultural heritage material that is, is related to the Middle East and North Africa. Um, in another sense, DLME is, is trying to become, uh, to learn about, you know, uh, uh, building a network of collaborators in the region to share labor knowledge um, and to focus on capacity building. Uh, what I'll focus on today, though, is more really about the, the aggregation uh, components of DLME and, and how, how that kind of plays out in, in Spotlight. Um, a little bit of background on funding. We, uh, we got a, 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 a grant from the Whiting Foundation in 2017 to build a kind of proof of concept that was, that was implemented in Spotlight. Um, shortly after that, we got a two-year Mellon Foundation uh, grant to turn, turn that prototype into more of a usable, um, useful application with, with more data and kind of just uh, tighten up some of the things that were quickly put together during the, the proto, uh, prototype phase to kind of make it more of a production level application. In uh, April 2020, we got the latest round of funding, um, a three-year grant from the Carter National Library. Um, we're in the midst of that, that um, grant and we're, we've really added a lot of collections and we'll continue to do so throughout this period. Um, we've also been focusing a lot on um, feature development um, that, that, that is driven by user research, trying to figure out what what features we really want to implement uh, in DLME and, and have a good justification um, for doing so. Um, the, one, one distinction, I think, of uh, between these three periods is, you know, the, the Whiting Foundation and to a large extent the Mellon Foundation periods, we were kind of left to our own devices at Stanford to implement the technical um, project as, as we've uh, saw fit um, with, uh, with our partnership with Carter National Library. We have a much more engaged partner uh, on the technical side um, with uh, more opinions about how things should be implemented. Um, and and uh, it, this partner is really driving a lot of the ideas behind uh, implementation. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of just highlight a, a few of the, um, the key differences between uh, some other Spotlight projects and uh, how DLME is implemented in Spotlight. Uh, for starters, one, one of the, the major differences um, is that uh, DLME is a, a single Spotlight exhibit um, with a, a lot of heter heterogeneous content. Um, we have uh, content uh, in 67 different languages to date, six different metadata languages, uh, dates ranging from 11,000 BCE to the current, um, lots of different types of objects, manuscripts, audio files, uh, video files, um, and, and more, you know, more to be added in the future. Um, uh, and then, you know, the data is, is an aggregation project, so data is coming in in a lot of different uh, schemas and standards. And so the, the, there's been a challenge really to think about how do you take all of this uh, varying content and present it to you know, users that may be interested in subsets of it? Um, you know, how do you aggregate the metadata? How do you uh, present it to different audiences um, that some of them may be interested more in the ancient material, some may be interested more in the modern material. Some are only interested in manuscripts, you know, and some might might like to browse all of the things at, at a kind of uh, general curiosity level. Um, 
one of the challenges that we faced kind of early on is um, how to implement the website for a dual language audience. At least we're, we're thinking, you know, the the users of the of the application are uh, at the very least English speaking and Arab speaking, and these are our two primary audiences. We're thinking, you know, there's there's always a possibility that we might, you know, add. Um, uh, add a third language or a fourth language down the road, but but these are the two primary languages. Um, and given that we have metadata in six different languages, you know, how do we present um, how do we present that metadata to different audiences? So if 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 someone is browsing in the English view of the website, which metadata do they see? You know, if we have some in, sometimes the metadata is available in English or French or Arabic or Persian, um, or if they're alternative, they're browsing in Arabic, you know, what metadata do they see? So we have this kind of uh, user experience kind of challenge to uh, present the navigational features of the site in either Arabic or, or English, um, and then present the, the, the metadata um, in the languages that it's available that are most appropriate for the audience. And so the decisions we kind of made were that um, for an Arabic speaking audience, if there is metadata available in Arabic, obviously that's the first choice. Um, if, if not, then we look for uh, metadata that's available in another Arabic script, like Persian, you know, for example, um, under the assumption that if, if someone reads Arabic, they can read Persian, even if they, they won't understand it fully, uh, necessarily. Um, and then in English, we kind of make this the, the reverse of that. If, it's a, if the metadata is available in English, we, we display it in English. Um, if not, we look for another Latin script language. And then if not, we display, you know, what we default to whatever we have available. Um, uh, one uh, kind of navigational and visual feature that we implemented recently about six months ago in our last work cycle was this kind of uh, carousel browse category navigation so we implemented browse categories and or browse categories were in place we uh, implemented browse groups as a way of kind of organizing uh, browse categories um, spotlight has that as a general feature dlme also implemented this kind of carousel browse so that we could uh, display the browse categories on the the home page of DLME, and then you know a user could navigate through through them with this, these carousel features using the arrows. Um, this was was one of the features that was requested by uh, our our funders at Carter National Library. Um, we have found you know recently that just from some some uh, hot jar data that we have on the site that um, this feature is highly used. Um, we don't really know, you know, much, much else about that. There's, of course, some trade-offs with this, you know, implementing this feature. Um, it makes maintenance a little harder, of course, whenever you implement um, a, a branch feature that's not integrated back into the, the core spotlight. Um, and also, we, we did suffer some performance um, uh, degradation with you know, loading all of these images and counts in, in the home page. Um, we, we did some work to clean that up and get it to a usable state, but, but that's, you know, it's a, it's a trade off you get for, for implementing this, this feature. Um, another feature we implemented in DLME that theoretically could be available uh, to any um, Spotlight exhibit. I, I don't think it's actually implemented in Spotlight though. Kathy can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I, I think this is also currently only implemented in DLME, um, is this dual calendar browser. Uh, so, so we have a date slider and we have a, you know, a date slider kind of calendar view in, um, in Spotlight. We implemented this kind of toggle switch where you could switch between Gregorian or Hedgery calendars and then search um, and filter over the results that way. Um, with uh, with the understanding that you know much of our material is is uh, from um, a world that part of a world that still use the uses the Hedgery calendar, um, so so that was a you know a bit of a challenge to implement too. And there's there was a bit of a 
there's some some uh, UX uh, research that had to be done and, and interviews and, and processing of how how users were interpreting this and, and, it, and it was a little bit of a challenge to kind of for our developers to kind of wrap their head around what, what we're trying to do. Um, but ultimately we're able to, to implement this and uh, you know we had some trade offs with, with this decision as well. Um, one being, you know, that we have this concept of uh, before common era, which is, is very commonplace for us in the Western world. Uh, before the the hedra, um, it, it's it's the concept is there. It's exactly analogous to to the BCE concept in, in our calendar. Um, it's used in scholarship, but it's not widely adopted or used in in the the Arab speaking world or the Muslim world. Um, and so for the average user, you're just kind of wrapping their head around what, you know, BH or before Hedra means, um, there was a little bit of challenges there to, to kind of work through. Um, we also implemented facet, uh, facet hierarchies um, for, for um, certain fields. The, the only field that's currently implemented on is type in DLME. But we wanted to be able to navigate to some higher level types and then subtypes below that. Um, this is another feature that I would imagine could uh, could be implemented in, in other spotlight exhibits down the road, but currently is only available in, in DLME, as, as I believe. Um, and then quickly, uh, we we have started to think a little bit about. Um, collaborative curation. We have a, a team of, uh, of curators, curatorial advisors that are, are working on DLME. Um, and we're at the very early stages of just trying to figure out what, what, having a, uh, what, what it will look like to have a team of these curatorial advisors um, help us determine decisions around you know, which browse groups and categories get implemented. How do we you know, search to, to create those categories? How do we ensure that the categories uh, don't drift over time as we add new content um, since they're, they're generated from search parameters? Um, many decisions like that. We're really too early in, the, um, in that process to say anything uh, insightful about it. We're still working out the, the business rules that will kind of determine how a group of us um, operates to make uh, suggestions and then decide uh, on on implementations, um, but but that is something that we're we're trying to work on. Um, and then just just so you all can take a look, um, here is the the URL for the site. Feel free to browse around and and um, see some of the features for yourself. Um, uh, I didn't put it on the slide, but I'm happy to to take any feedback that uh, that anyone has. Um, you can, you can, there's feedback forms on DLME site that you can share. Um, and also if you want to just uh, ask more general questions, uh, my email is jtim at stanford.edu. Feel free to email me and I'm, I'm happy to take any questions about um, the development or, or the site in, in general. And that is all I have for the, the presentation, but I'm happy to take any questions. Jacob, would you be willing to, um actually switch over from the slides to the DLME um, site. Um, sure. um, that might um, facil facilitate, uh, I mean, I know that people are have probably looked at it, but um, that might help with specific questions. And um, yeah, this is, I, I also wanna comment that this is our first um, implementation of um, a uh, right to left, um, for do because this yeah. this exhibit is in English and Arabic, and so that of course presented some uh, very particular development challenges, um, as as you all can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. So everything's inverted in the in the right to left view. You know, the, everything switches sides. Of course, the language is the language reads from right to left, but also the navigation as well. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think questions would be good. And then um, um, we might have an interesting um, discussion around working with, you know, some pretty strong-minded stakeholders and some of the 
you know, creative ways that Jacob has managed that relationship. This is very cool. I am um, very interested in multilingual, multi-script, multicultural uh, work. And I was wondering about the dates in particular, just to be specific something a particular case study kind of a thing so was that uh, the, do you have um, all of the metadata in Gregorian and then convert from there through some kind of transformation or um, how do you handle um, date metadata sure yeah um, yeah so I mean dual dual calendar you know, functionality is not really common in the West. We just typically expect everyone to work in our calendar system. Uh, it is more common in the Far East. You know, you'll see it in some digital library projects in Asia. Um, I, I think one of the challenges with an aggregation problem is exactly what you talked about. How do you get the, the metadata? Um, and we we have to drive any calendar system. We have to take the the raw metadata that we're given and convert it into some kind of year year array integers that are machine processable, right? So we had to do that as a, as a first step to just drive the, the general spotlight calendar widget. Um, from there, we, we basically just uh, have a, a, um, a macro that converts those, head, those Gregorian years to Hedger years. So we do that in the, the ETL kind of pipeline we're harvesting the metadata, we're mapping it to our standard. And as we map it, we uh, enrich the metadata with, um, with the year arrays for the Gregorian and then also for the Hedger. Interesting. And, and we've, we've even had, you know, we have one case, um, this Nashria digital Iranian history, where, where they're actually using a different, they're, they're using the Iranian Hedger system. So we haven't even worked through that yet and don't even know what we're, we're, we're going to do yet, but essentially you can't really filter over those by date because it's in a different calendar system and we haven't yet decided if we're going to, to you know, uh, convert those or, or, you know, at what point do we, you know, just say, you know, we can't, we can't do that. It's too, it's too much work and, and stop there. So we haven't really worked through that yet, but we, we have at least, you know, three calendar systems now. Um, Jacob, I wonder if you might um, show the contributors page because um, that's something where um, I don't know that that exactly, it lives in the exhibit. I don't know that it, it lives in spotlight. I, I'm a little unclear about that. But this is, if you just kind of, uh, can you just scroll? A yeah, little yeah this is another yeah. custom kind of custom page that's generated from the, the data that we have in, in solar. Um, but I don't think it actually has anything to do with spotlight. It's yeah, I don't think it. I don't think it does either. But that's so. So that's um. But that's another special thing um, for this very diverse and aggregated um, collections here, so that contributors are able to see the different institutions, the different. Um, countries and different types of materials and all of that and that I think that was a pretty big value add that was we knew we needed I mean we've been doing this for a long time now it's been refined right but yeah yeah it has and we actually you know we had some scheduled some development time to do further work on it and then realized we just don't know what else we want to develop here yet um, and so we, we paused that we definitely want to show some some site statistics we want to highlight you know data partners so you know we have the data contributors that you know the, the institutions that share the data with us but also the item contributors in many cases these are the same but in some cases the physical objects are, are in another place that, that is not with the, the holder of the, the metadata or the digital records and so we want to really highlight you know both of those like, like the case with our funding partner the records are in the british library um, but they're served through Cutter National Library, uh, through their Cutter, Di uh, Cutter Digital Library. Um, and so, you know, we have, you know, a different data contributor than, than item contributor in that case. 
And so, yeah, we had we had a lot of thoughts, you know, or do we want to show a map view or, or you know, some other other ideas that we came up with and, and just realized that it's a lot of work and we don't really know what's what would be useful at this point. And so we kind of have, have, um, paused um, development of this to, to think about other things. Um, but I think it, in theory, we, we would come back to this in the future and, and improve it. Um, one of the things I'll say that we're, we're working on now is a collections registry. Collections weren't really a thing in DLME until this week. Um, and and to, to drive this kind of collections, collections registry and link to those collections in DLME, um, we, we needed to kind of implement collections where they had a stable URL in DLME and we could link back to them and, and, and know that that URL would work you know, in the future. Um, so I could imagine something like data from that coming in here as well and uh, currently our collections are, are driven by uh, something different um, and so so that number will change and be more precise but then we'll also potentially be able to even link to metadata about the collections instead of just just metadata about records um and jacob one more thing could you go to the browse uh, page be, uh, the, which is named Explore here, just to let everybody know that um, the, uh, the, the recent um, enhancement of Spotlight Core to allow the creation of um, browse groups is being used here by DLME. Yeah, so these are all of our browse groups. Um, and of course, <clears throat> these are the same things that are implemented on the homepage here with our carousel facet. So this is the kind of custom uh, carousel widget that we put, we put there for browsing. We have found that people use this a lot more than, than this, um, although they, you know, they both do the same thing. Are there other questions? Well, it sounded like the juicy bits would be the um, dealing with, I think the word was opinionated partners. Is Are there any um, stories to tell there that you feel like sharing? Yeah, I don't know if we have stories. It's it's a, maybe it's a, a, a way of developing that we aren't, weren't, you know, so familiar with. Um, at DLSS, I think, you know, Mellon funded projects and other project projects in the US that we we've have, have had funded are a little, you know, there's a little more of a deferential kind of approach to the technical implementation. Um, I think the vision of DLME from the beginning was that eventually we will find a technical partner in the Middle East that will take over the project. And so that vision, you know, required a different kind of engagement from a funder. And, and, and I think uh, Qatar National Library is that partner that we're, um, we're thinking, you know, may end up taking over the, the technical uh, management, maintenance, you know, development of the project. And so there was an, a need for them to be more opinionated and to, to understand the decisions that were being made on, on one hand. Um, and I think there's just a different business culture too, um, where where uh, there there is a much more kind of careful uh, accounting of the, of the decisions, um, uh, so, so that they can be explained, you know, inside of their organization. Um, overall, I think it's been a a good thing. It's it's enabled us to be a lot more organized, kind of going into work cycles, have a much clearer plan. Um, because we don't want to be in the middle of a work cycle trying to figure out what we're actually doing and, and still negotiating the, those things. So it forced us to really kind of clarify them up front, do a lot more preparation going into the work cycle. And I think that's ultimately, you know, has been a, a benefit to the project. Um, we're, we're now thinking of development, you know, six months out instead of um, the, the, you know, sprint zero week, we're trying to wrap our heads around still what, what's being done. Um, during during the work cycle, um, so I think that's been really helpful, um, and I think both both partners have benefited from um, from that relationship. So um, nothing nothing really particularly juicy, just uh, some uh, unusual you know uh, partnership practices that I think ultimately ended up 
um, challenging us to, to be a little bit more organized and to kind of uh, uh, manage the project a little bit better and plan a little bit better. Um, I guess I want to I want to say, um, and this is just my opinion. I actually think that we are organized. That's my bias. <laughs> um, sure. But what but what we have we have not been able to be as agile um, with this project as we typically um, as we typically are. So um, to Jacob's point, it really did force us to make sure, for instance, um, the, our user experience designer that works on this, that works on DLME, um, oftentimes, you know, he wouldn't be working on designs until, well, maybe a couple weeks before a work cycle, but then throughout a work cycle, right? We would just kind of, and that resulted in some blockers sometimes, and that, and that just wasn't going to work for this project. Um, and so this fall, that designer has, um, very specific large chunks of time allocated to do a bunch of design work up front so that we can do a better job of hitting the ground running. Um, I would say that the time difference is a pretty big deal here. It's one thing if you're dealing with Europe, but once you go beyond that eight hour time difference, it's um, fortunately Jacob is located on the East Coast. So that has kind of helped from you know what with his data and project manager hat right but harder for harder for us on the west coast when we you know needed to um collaborate or have a dialogue dialogue with those folks and i guess the other thing i just wanted to mention here is um because at stanford we're so heavily invested in open source for all of our digital library work um it's been, I think, an educational process and at times a little bit of a challenging one, you know, working with our partners, trying to, trying to help them understand why we're always thinking about sustainability with these open source applications. And when people are asking for custom features, like Jacob said, where we have a, an, another branch that has to also be maintained, um, we worry because we're well staffed, but we're spread way too thin. Just like you all, we have far more things in the portfolio than we really have resources to be able to accomplish all the things that we wish we could. And so the more this spreads us thin, the, the more of a challenge it is, right? We would love for this to have been a plain vanilla spotlight out of the box, but it's simply, would have fallen too far short of the goals for this project and this collaboration. It sounds like you're saying that the design needed to be, instead of icing on the top, it needed to become more foundational, which kind of would make sense with things like by dye text and um, all these other um, parameters to have to keep in mind. Does that sound right? Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. And I think, you know, many of those things did the bi-directional, for example, did come back into core spotlight. And so it could be implemented in, in other projects. And uh, I think some of the things that are currently uh, unique to DLME could come into core spotlight down the road. You know, I think that the question is just, can we demonstrate that there's a bigger need than just DLME? like the dual calendar system. We currently don't have another project that's asked for that. So there's no need to put that in core spotlight, but you know, it is a common feature in some digital libraries in the, the Far East. And if we have other projects that have interest in that, then, you know, of course that, that would, you know, would be, we would consider porting that to, to the core library. And, and then, you know, maybe it's re-implemented in a, in, a, in a different way um, and of course, you know, maintenance becomes easier down the road and, you know, the, you know, the, the community benefits from that feature if, if there's a need, so. Right, so I think it's been, um, it's necessitated a culture shift for us um, at Stanford Libraries with the, you know, with our development team. The other unique thing about this project is because 
the ETL pipeline needed to really be worked on and developed to sort of help Jacob and just it's this particular project, we have two software development teams, one called infrastructure, the other called access. Um, it doesn't necessarily conform to only the user facing things the <laughs> access team works on and only the under the hood things the infrastructure team works on, but it kind of skews a little bit that way. It turns out that the infrastructure team has been an equal partner in this with the access team. So the access team has worked on the spotlight part and the, <laughs> and the infrastructure team has worked on a lot of under the hood stuff, which Jacob could say more about. But the funny thing is with such a large department, those two development teams, they each have their own different culture, <laughs> right? They're a little different from one another. So try internally trying to make sure that we're all talking to one another and that there's a clear division of labor and a clear acknowledgement of where the overlaps are, I think has um, also provided a unique um, management challenge. Yeah, um, we have some, you know, we just finished a work cycle where we are, are able to fully automate the ETL pipeline. Um, which is great, you know, I'm sure I'll have a chance to talk about that in detail at, at another time, but the infrastructure team works on that, the access team typically works on this, the spotlight exhibit application, um, but the infrastructure team is the team that actually implemented DLME to begin with, and they did it in a different way than, than the access team would typically do it um, in AWS, uh, in Terraform, you know, and and so then there was a, you know, some challenges transferring the project over to, to um, access team for, for long-term development and maintenance. Um, and there's still this, you know, big gray area between the two teams and, you know, whose role is it, you know, when the, the solar instance crashes out of nowhere and we think we need to, um, you know, uh, uh, implement it in AWS in a different way. Um, you know, does that fall under access or does that fall under infrastructure since they're the ones who originally did it? You know, th those kinds of questions that we're still working through. Any other questions or comments? I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.